We are with the spark plug, Dylan Bassett. And for those of you who have not seen him since 2011, he has not gotten much taller, but he's got hair on his face. He is becoming a man. He's not the 14-year-old boy you saw when – how many races was it that year, that 2011? Was that like 14, 15-something races? It was, it was a pretty incredible streak. Yeah, I think it was – I think we ended up with 13 or 14, uh, 10 in a row still. Still yeah. pretty proud about that one. Still barring that one night that you and Jimmy Rice decided to play bumper cars on the <laughs> – whatever, I think that was coming out of turn four. Yeah, yeah, it was. But, uh, bad night, bad night. Hey, that's all right. Those, you got to have those nights. Yeah. But it's good to just see you, man. It's been it's been so long after you kind of came through A-Speedway and you, you moved on up and ran UARA and K&N and now all the way up to running part-time in the Xfinity stuff. I mean, it's – the thing on Facebook is the whole the whole ten year challenge thing, and I just think about even for you, from 2010 when you when I saw you you ran a few races I think at Ace and Caraway, to now it's like I mean that's a heck of a journey in just ten yeah. years. How how is it on your end? It's been crazy. Um, a lot of racing that's been done between now and then, and a lot of things that I've learned throughout the years. But it's been a wild ride. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, I never thought I was going to get the chance to drive the Xfinity Series because, I mean, this day and time it does come down to just spending money. I mean, if you can spend money, you're going to be put in a car, and that's the unfortunate thing. But um, my parents, they have definitely they have worked their tails off just to get me and Ronnie where we are, and um, it's something I'll be forever grateful for. And, you know, we just go out there each and every night just trying to make them proud because we see how hard they work. And uh, me and Ronnie actually be hanging gutter with my dad a lot just so we can make it to the racetrack. You know, back when you – I know you, you got started at a really young age. Both of y'all did. Um, did you ever think this far down the road that you would still be doing in your 20s? Or did you kind of think it was just something to do at the moment and you didn't quite think – did you ever think this far forward or was it kind of just in the moment? Um, I did think this far forward. You know, this is – you know, when you're young, you do it because that's what you like to do, you know. But as I was getting older, you know, you start falling in love with the sport. And then you start wanting to make a career out of it. You never know if you can because there's just so many things that you can't control um, in the racing world. Really much just in the world in general. But, um, you know, me and Ronnie both have fought to make this our career. So um, just to even say that we made it, it's a huge accomplishment. Yeah, I know you guys came from running the Bandoleros and the Legends cars and then I know your brother had kind of had gotten into the UARA late models. I didn't really become aware of you until 2010. I'd, I'd heard of Ronnie, um, and then you come along, and I heard the same thing about you then that like Langley Austin and other people say about you now is like that you were, you seem like one of those guys that just kind of had the natural kind of talent, like you had the hand-eye coordination and stuff. Did it feel that natural to you, or did you kind of did you really have to work at it to make it look? <laughs> because you made it look really easy on a Speedway Friday nights. You know, we do put a lot of work in the both of us do. Um, you know, some of it I would say probably is natural. Like there's just some things that you just can't really teach. But you know, I have put in a lot of work um, just behind simulators, i racing, just racing in general. You know, trying to stay up to date as much as you can and I think working on your car especially at a young age you know my dad told us if we wanted to race you know you're going to work on your race car there's just this is what it is you know I think that has a lot to do with it as well because this generation they just don't work on their race cars you know they show up with their suit and their helmet and then they're ready to go racing and there's nothing wrong with that if you can do it that way but that's just not the way that we were taught that we were going to race and, you know I think that plays a lot into it as well. Part of me kind of thinks that's why you were so clean. That one of the things me and Brad did a whole episode going through the champions of a speedway, and when we got to you, one of the things that came up was that as you would comb through the field because you were having to start in the rear, we never remember you dumping anybody or, or you know knocking them loose. Anything, any content was was really incidental. And now I kind of see why because you were going to have to fix it if you crinkled the nose or something crazy. Whereas a lot of people don't like you, you see some super late model races where, I mean, they just tear them apart and I'm sure, you know, late model Xfinity, it, it goes all the way to the top. 
but working on it makes that much of a difference. It does, and you know, there's been times in my career where I've made a lot of stupid mistakes, but you know, at the end of the day, I was the one, along with my guys, that had to fix it. You know, it's not just myself. I'm not trying to take any of the credit because, I mean, the guys that my dad has placed around me is also a big part of it. But at the end of the day, you know, we're out here one, two in the morning because we don't have a big team trying to fix the stuff that we tore up, you know. So the, stu the stupid mistakes just aren't really worth it. And, you know, as the older we get, you know, you start to realize that. But, you know, there is a lot of people that only remember the bad mistakes that you do and not really always the good, but you know, it's just part of the world, I guess. I will say, not not a mistake on your part, but one of the things I saw from you that like, I, it kind of scared me and it kind of wowed me was that wreck you got into at Concord on the triangle where <laughs> the whole race car <laughs> left the track over and was it, was it the top of the dog leg or was it turn three? Like, what was going through your mind on that one? That was incredible. Well, <laughs> well it started uh, in the dog leg, and then it carried all the way to the entrance of turn three. Um, it was a green-white checkered. You know, my dad had been telling me all week prior to the race uh, how tricky the dog leg is and how dangerous it can be. Um, so, we, you know, we tried to keep it clean throughout the whole race, especially through that portion of the racetrack. You know, the first time I've ever been there, so I really didn't know what to expect. But um, we had a really fast race car that night, and it – Unfortunately, came down to a green-white checkered. Uh, I think I restarted fourth, and um, me and Sean Rahal just Rahal just got together. You know, he kind of pinched me up in the fence, and then it just turned oh into a disaster after That's that. About, I was about to say that was just that had to scare your mom. That had to. Did you did you get a phone or was mom there? Yeah, I think my dad was actually more scared. You know, I seen him. He was wearing flip flops because he was just sitting in the stands. And um, when I got out of the car, you know, he's standing almost right beside me. I'm like, how do you even get there? He was jumping <laughs> fences. and yeah. But it was, uh, yeah, it was, I think he probably got more scared than my mom did. Going back to 2011, you were moving up from, I hate to call them little cars, but just smaller, not the full-size cars. And you you come run the full season at Ace and, and you win so much. But getting into that full-size car, what was kind of, going back what was kind of the first things that you kind of had to learn as a driver as far as just adjusting to having a race car that's just so much bigger and and you're out there with grown men not people not necessarily people that were your own age what was kind of the first things that you had to learn just in that season alone before you even moved up to UARA um, the biggest thing you know that you have to learn when you start switching series is the first thing is how big the cars are. You know, that kind of sounds pretty simple. But when you're sitting in the car, you're not in the middle. You're off to the left side. So you have to learn where the right side of the car is so you're not running into the wall, other people. Then you got to learn where the nose is so you don't just go off in the corner and spin somebody out. And then you, then you eventually learn what the horsepower is going to do. And then even the weight of the car, you know, that's a really big difference. Um, I remember the first time I sat in a limited car on the racetrack, went out there. I mean, I about wrecked because, you know, the smaller cars, they obviously don't weigh as much. You drive them off in the corner. It's fine. When you're slinging 3,000 pounds around, you know, it's a big difference. And that was on, honestly the biggest thing I struggled with the first time I sat in the Xfinity car at Richmond. Well, it wasn't really the horsepower because once you get older, you start learning, like, well, how much horsepower, what it's going to do. You kind of just know that when you race for so long. But the weight of the cars is just huge, and it sounds so simple, but it's really not. And it's crazy how much just 400 pounds versus whatever is. And it's a lot when you're going 100 and some mile an hour. Yeah, I was about to say, that was something we were looking at your cars over here in the shop. When you moved from late model up to K&N, just the car, it looks different. But I think the thing that's probably most people in the stands don't see is just the weight difference from a late model to that K and N car, and you ran it for uh, 2015 through 2018. How how big an adjustment was that for you? Because I know that late model stock, there's guys that talk about running late models for ten something years, and they still struggle, and they still have to work their tail off to get the car through the corner. So, what was what was K and N like? How, how how big a jump was that for you? It was a pretty big jump. Um, I felt like I adapted fairly quick. Um, there towards the end of my K&N career, you know, things started getting so up to date with actually what we're running now. And we honestly, we just had no idea. Um, and we were kind of, I hate to say it this way, but we were a little 
out to left field in our K&M program just because we'd never seen it before, so none of us never knew. And then when we bought these Xfinity cars, we realized what those guys were doing, and now we realize what we were getting beat by. So I'd love to sit in a K&M car today with what we know now, but it's just it's a big difference, and it's it's crazy that how much that the stuff evolves and changes. It seemed like you didn't get to race as much either because the K&N series was – I remember back when it was like the Camping World Series or whatever it was before, and they, they raced so much more, and the scale the schedule just got smaller and smaller, whereas it seemed like when you were running late models, you had way more opportunities to race. Did that kind of affect you a little bit, just not being able to be in the seat as much? Absolutely. You know, seat time is everything. I'd love to sit in a race car every day if I could, and just to make laps. And, you know, that was another thing that my dad – provided my brother and I when we were younger um, he built a racetrack out in our backyard right in front of our race shop and every day after school was a hundred laps it didn't matter and you know then we hated it you know we never wanted to come home we want to go hang out with our friends or something and he's like no you're going to go out here and drive a hundred laps and you know, it was miserable then but now you get older and you're like man like that's just I would love to do that now and yeah. it's just not you just don't have that opportunity and it, I realize now how valuable it was in my career. Yeah, I was about to say, it. it uh, I think about it, I try to go to Charlotte when the World of Outlaws run there, and I heard a guy come over, he had never seen him. He was just a NASCAR fan. And he was just amazed by him, and he was like, you know, how are these, you know, are these guys that much better than who's on TV? And I told him, I was like, well, you got to think, they run 95, 100 races a year. And like you're saying, just – that seat time makes a difference, even no matter what your discipline is. So, just be you got you just got to be out there. There's right. no the simulator can only do so much, can Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Well, I was super glad to see this year because you, you got to run some time in the Xfinity Series. And my dad, my dad, and my sister, and a bunch of A Speedway people were. It was so cool just to see somebody you knew mm -hmm. running on TV. Um, how did y'all even end up there? Like, why didn't – it seems like, you know, some people go the truck route or they go ARCA, and I know money is obviously a factor in all of it, but what kind of led you guys to do the Xfinity deal with you and your brother? So, at the end of last year of our K&N, um, the guy that's over the K&N series obviously talks to the owners, and they were bringing up changes that they were going to do for 2020. And – um the changes just didn't really make sense to us. Um, the way that they're doing it now is they're still running very limited actual, I guess it's not K&N anymore, it's the ARCA E-Series or whatever it is. Yeah, they've kind of combined it all into one. Yeah, so like that series doesn't really change that much besides you can now run an Elmore engine, which costs double of what our Xfinity engine costs. That's crazy. And then... And it's two levels technically below. Absolutely. So, and then <laughs> when you run the top series, you're still going to have your live pit stop. You're going to have all the tires, and it just don't pay the same. So, we looked at the Xfinity option. We did skip the truck option because they still have the steel bodies, and the bodies themselves is uh, it's just outrageous what they cost. It's not like it was when, when Harry Hogg made a body for Cole Trickle's car in Days of Thunder. No. <laughs> no, it's not. And just the body alone in the trucks is not real reasonable unless you have a sponsor. And then, again, they run the Elmore engine, which is expensive expensive compared <laughs> to the Xfinity engine. And then the Xfinity cars, they now went to that flange fit body like our K&N car. So if you go and knock a fender off, you don't have to take it to the body guy and spend a couple thousand dollars for somebody else to put a fender on it. You know, we can do that here in our own shop and things like that. So it just made more sense to kind of go that route, especially um, knowing what the K&N changes were going to be. And then, like I said, the truck deal just doesn't really make sense for us. Yeah. When you guys were running K&N, I'm sure – being at some of those tracks and being at that level, you kind of maybe start to see some of the guys that own teams and truck and Xfinity at least send feelers out and about. Because my, my dad kept asking me, he was like, I wonder why someone hadn't signed him on driver development or something. And I always thought just in my mind, you can correct us if I'm wrong, I was like, well, he probably doesn't have enough of a check to write because it, it all just seems about what check you're bringing 
I mean, talent matters, but the check kind of seems to matter first. Is it? Can you? What, what, am, am I out in left field on that assumption? No, you pretty much hit the nail right on the head. I mean, not to discredit any of the drivers in the Xfinity series because I'm I'm not trying to do that, but you know, a lot of it's just this day and time that money really means more than anything. I mean, it's just what it is. You know, that's kind of why we do our own team because my dad doesn't have enough money just to go run a full season in the Xfinity series. It's it's an outrageous number. I mean, it really is. And so the way that we do it, I mean, it's just what we can do. And we made it a family thing from the beginning, and that's pretty much how we've kept it so far. Yeah. So take me inside kind of behind the scenes a little bit of how it works. How do you guys decide what races you're going to hit, what races you're going to kind of set aside, which ones you drive, which ones Ronnie drives? How does – how does all that kind of come together a little bit behind the scenes? This year was a little bit more complicated just because um, even the tracks that we've been to in the K&N series, it doesn't translate to the Xfinity series. So we had to get approved. to. So we had to run certain races just to get approved to go somewhere else. So Ronnie ran Phoenix at the beginning of the year because he ran the K&N car there. Um, so they let him run the Xfinity car there. But he had to run a short track just to get approved for the next track. And so it was a, the beginning was a little bit wild. Um, so he ran Phoenix to get approved for Texas, and then he ran a mile and a half to get approved for something bigger. And then I ran Richmond because we ran the late models and the Canyon cars there. So they let me go to Richmond. So I ran Richmond to try to get approved for something bigger, like a mile and a half. And then we both attempted Charlotte. Um, unfortunately, my car was less than 70 thousandths wrong on the body. Oh. So I didn't even get to make a qualifying attempt, so I didn't even get to race. Um, but he ran Charlotte. And then after after we got approved, we just kind of picked and chose how we wanted to. It's a lot different. It's not like at the DMV where you go just take a test with somebody that's probably halfway paying attention and half sober. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a lot different in NASCAR. You actually have to go and... It's not like you can just go out there and do a one-on-one. It's it's based on like your previous experience. So, hence why you know the super speedways and stuff. I guess that's like the hardest one to get to. Yeah, it's the hardest, and it's kind of weird because Charlotte is way harder than Daytona. But it's just the way it. I guess because it's so big and so fast. But do I told you when I was practicing at Charlotte, that was probably the hardest place I've ever tried to get around. See, that's crazy. Like it just that that amazes me. So okay. So now we get into what was going to Xfinity like, and like just from, just from getting in. You know, I'm so you know so many of these people that listen, and my myself used to going up to a ticket booth, twenty five thirty bucks for a pit pass. I get my armband. I might show one or two people. We walk around like it's nothing, and it's you know it's just the level that we're at. How much different is it with the NASCAR with the pre injuries and all the other just media obligations all that other stuff it is honestly it's pretty complicated um you know you have to submit a picture of what your car is going to look like before every race you have to you have a roster limit you can only have so many people at the racetrack um that work on the car um so you have to submit that a week before the race um, you have to obviously do your entry blank. I think it's a week or two weeks before the race. And if you don't submit your entry blank, then they take some of your money at the end of the race. Um, and then they do your passes. You can either do a hard card where you can just walk in every week. Um, they're obviously more expensive to do that. And we decided not to do that this year because we weren't going to every race. It don't make sense if you don't run every race. So we just bought a normal license. We have to sign in every week, pretty much like y'all do. But we don't get wristbands. We get little cards. Oh, okay. And you walk, they have your name on them. And, I mean, you can't even walk to the bathroom without having to show somebody. That bad. <laughs> I mean, it, it gets pretty bad. I mean, they, always, they want you to wear them around your neck so that you can see them all the time. But, I mean, when you're working and all this stuff, it's... It, so it's kind of a mess, but, you know, they do a really good job of 
they're trying to incorporate the fans now. You know, a lot of tracks are actually having fan zones. And, I mean, the fans are, like, right there while you're trying to work, which is kind of cool. I mean, because they got their section, so they're not right in the way. Yeah. But they're, like, right on top. And, I mean, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's cool to see the fans that still enjoy racing. That and, God forbid, if a heated discussion breaks out, they're right there with their phone and they can go Facebook Live and record it. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. I tell you, Richmond is probably – Richmond and Phoenix – Probably have the two coolest fan zones that I've been to this year. I know they spent the most money redoing them. Where, like, as a fan, you get, I mean, you get right up there. I mean, you could probably spit and hit one, couldn't <laughs> yep, you? Absolutely. That's something. So when you when you go run these Xfinity races, um, yeah, I know you get practices and you qualify and stuff like that. But just from the local level, it seemed like. You'd go practice. You might talk to whoever's heading up your crew, or you yourself would make your adjustments. How much harder is it just to work on the car, even just on adjustments, than it is back in like your late model days and stuff? Honestly, and it's going to sound really weird, but these cars you do way less changes. Okay. Um, you pretty much, and I think most of it is because you only get a fifty-minute practice. Yeah, I mean, which that's more than, I guess, your local short track, but, like, you can't test, and um, you get two 50-minute practices if it don't rain or weather or whatever, and then you go qualify. So if you're not close when you come off the truck, you're... You're done for. You're, yeah, I mean, it's tough. Like, there's not very many big swing is, swings at the car because you typically only make four or five runs at the most, and then at the bigger tracks, it becomes less because it takes forever to get in and out of the pits which sounds really little but we're when you're talking about seconds i mean it's it's a big deal i mean you're taking 32 seconds to make a lap you run about five laps and then you're taking another two minutes to get in the pits like practice really goes by really quick in this series you know what i always kind of wondered if guys get lost because when if if you go to a NASCAR track and just watch practice, not on TV, but you go and watch as you guys come off and make that turn into the garage, wherever that point is, and you guys are there. Usually, Cup is there, or, or maybe trucks too. So there's there's more than one set of cars. Like, how easy is it to just get lost finding your garage stall? Because you're at a different track every time. Actually, it's extremely easy. Uh, but thankfully, NASCAR does send out an email with all the um, stuff. So you can see pit road flow. Um, so that does help. Like, it'll be two minutes before practice, and I'm studying just the pit road flow because I don't want to get lost. And it is really easy because the places are ginormous compared to your local short track. And it's just it's crazy. How much, uh, how much work did you have to do on the pit stops? Because I remember at, at Ace... Uh, the, the only Achilles heel you had was restarts, and that used to. I used to get nervous in the tower for you because I'd be like, "I know he's been out here working on it, but it makes me nervous every time. And if he bottles up, they're gonna bottle up behind him." So <laughs> I'm sure as you got into this stuff, I mean, pit stops is a big thing because you guys stop what, four or five times a race, something like that. Or how how much work was that for you to to kind of get the pit stop down pat? It's extremely difficult. I mean, at Dover this year, we went to make a green flag pit stop, and I spun out. I mean, I was coming off the bank, and um, I downshifted a little too early, and Will hopped and spun out. And luckily, there was a caution. We didn't lose a lap. Uh, still finished 14th. But, I mean, it was the end of the race. We probably were going to come out cherry because the way that the green flag pit stops were working out, you know, and uh, then I spun out. So it's, it's extremely difficult. Um, they're probably one of the hardest parts of racing. Um, they're very important. You don't want to speed because then you're just giving up track position when you speed. But if you don't push it, then people are passing you down pit road. You're slowing down. Like if you lollygag getting into your stall, which I struggled with at the beginning because I was trying not to speed, then it messes the pit crew up because, you know, they're in a routine. And then when you're coming into your box slow, it just messes them up because then they're not in the right spot. So there's a lot that goes on um, to the pit stops. But um, luckily, the tax that we got, you don't have to look at the numbers. They have lights. Yeah, I was about to say, it's not like back in the day when your spotter would come across the radio and tell you, like, 4,200 second gear. It's You have lights now. So you're – how many lights do you have? 
Like is it um, like like a like a do, warning light and then a you went too fast light? Well, we have seven green lights, so if you're green, you're good. And then we normally set our tack to where it'll bounce from two to three red, and you're max. If you're solid three red, you're speeding. Yeah. So we, I t- typically take the safe side. I'll bounce from one to two red. Um, but my spotter's like, all right, three red, go go go. I'm like. Yeah. Nah, bro. <laughs> no, we're not doing that. I, I, don't, I don't want to give up my track position. I was about to say. Um, another thing. I know I'm, I'm probably asking a lot of dumb questions, but it's just stuff I'm really curious about. Um, the pit crew, is it – do you have like the same – do you guys have the same group of guys every week? Is it kind of a rotational deal? How does how does the pit crew side work? Because it's a, it's a long way from – I know my uncle was working for Penske in 93 – he was an engine builder in the shop, and then at the track, he would sometimes catch can or sometimes he would jack until he got a little older, and it was the shop guys, where now, obviously, they're, they're hired guns. So how does, like, the pit crew side of it work for you guys? Um, in the Xfinity Series, um, we actually have to rent our pit guns from NASCAR. So I guess they kind of did away with that because some of the teams were building their own guns, and they were super fast. But um, the pit crew, um, so at the beginning of the year, it was a little frustrating. Um, we tried to go a little bit cheaper because we have to pay the pit crew, and we went decided to go with the company. I don't really want to call their name because that's okay. Bad. We uh, we ended up having to switch towards the end of the year, but like at Richmond, my first race, you know, we would come in running fourteenth, and you know, you hit your marks as best you can, and then you come out twenty first, twenty second. You've yeah, worked that hard to pass cars, and you lost it on pit road. And it was every week. And then it got to the point to where they were leaving a wheel loose, you know. And it's a lot of things you just can't have, you know. If you're if you're going to be a little bit slower, you at least need to get all the fuel in the car. You need to get all the tire sight. That's you know, and that was very important. And you know that that started to slack on their part a little bit. We had a few loose wheels. Um, and then if there's a loose wheel at the end of the race, it's a ten thousand dollar fine. Golly! And then, uh, <laughs> and then it got to the point to where I mean, we got to where we couldn't even make adjustments. This was four tires and fuel, and they were thirty seconds. And that's where, gonna, that's getting you killed out yeah, there. Yeah, you're losing everything that you gained. So there, towards the end of the year, um, crew chief actually is buddies with one of the guys that develops the Joe Gibbs pit crew. So we got a deal worked out with them to where we had a development Gibbs crew. And they were they were lights out. They were really good for us. See, that's, just, that's another thing I don't think people realize. I think sometimes at, at Cup, you'll see some of the same guys on a crew for a while. Or, you know, obviously back in the 90s it was a lot different. And guys would, you know, it was just a whole different deal where now it's you have to – it's basically like rent a pit crew and – I mean, you you can't do nothing because you're in the seat. Right. I mean, there's only so much you can holler on the radio. You, <laughs> it's not going to make it any better. So, I can't imagine that frustration because you're because you're only getting so many races. So every opportunity matters so much more to you. I can't imagine how much steam came out of your ears. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, honestly, yelling at them just it's not even worth it because then they mess up more. So you know what. I had to learn some people skills. Yeah. See, when I was younger, I was really fiery. Even though I'm really small, you know, I still had a bad attitude. Um, the older I get, you know, I try to put things in perspective. You know, it's not really worth losing your temper on something because, you know, at the end of the day, they still have to work on it. So you yelling at them is just not going to help. Gotcha. Well, I was super proud of you this year. The races, I went looking back on racing reference to make sure I didn't screw up. Of the ones that you didn't have something break or something, I mean, you're, I think yours finished with 16th at Kansas. I mean, you're up there. I mean, I know you want to win, obviously. That's everybody's goal. But in that series where you're running against cup teams and, and cup money for some of those teams, does a top 12, top 14 feel like a win sometimes? Absolutely. You know, you said Kansas, we finished 16th. We ran inside 12th, 13th all day. Um, we had a bad restart there. Uh, I think there was like three to go or something. Um, they ended up, we ended up getting lined up wrong by NASCAR, and you know they just dropped the green anymore. Yeah, <laughs> I lost three spots on the lineup. Didn't even take the green. I lost three spots. 
Jeez. But, um, you know, it's just part of kind of running in the middle of the field. You know, they kind of worry about the leaders and whatever. So they didn't even think, second thought about it, dropped the green flag, and we'd already lost three spots. But, um, you know, finishing inside the top 15 is huge. Um, you know, when we started this year, we all sat down and we're like, we want to try to run top 20. Because okay. we just didn't know. And, like, so we don't have the A engine. We kind of went with the B motor just because it fit our budget. And we, just going in, you know, we didn't want to set our expectations too high and then struggle and then be like, just throw in the towel. So we kind of went in with an open mind just because you don't know. And it is a tough deal. You know, the Xfinity Series is super tough. I feel like there's a lot of good competition in the Xfinity Series. So we kind of went in with an open mind. Um, and the first race out you know finished 15th you're like you know that's a huge accomplishment and you know there was races pretty much all year that we felt like we were actually better than our finish that's why i think it would be so beneficial to people to be at the race because tv is always going to focus on kind of that top 10 and the the familiar names that maybe they know or if if it's one of those races where the cup guys come down where if you look back there, I mean, you'll see some good stories. Like you guys or, you know, I mean, some of the others, like a Ross Chastain or, or somebody like that that's, I mean, that's such a shot in the arm to run even right there. It kind of made me think, I read uh, I read J.D. McDuffie's book, the former NASCAR Independent, and he talked about how there was two races going on at the same time in Cup in his day, and it was the race – for the win with all the money is mm -hmm. and the race amongst all the rest of us that were scraping and clawing just to get to the track and wasn't bringing a big toter home it was back you know <laughs> rolling on barely anything i'm sure it's even though the car is different i'm sure it's a lot of the same yeah and there's a there's something else a lot of people don't realize the very first richmond race and even the second race um, the first race, about midway through the first segment, I ran 15 straight laps the fastest car on the racetrack. Wow. Off the uh, timing and scoring. That's not a stopwatch. That's, yeah, that's not, that's not that's grandma's the, stopwatch. Yeah, <laughs> that's the, um, the transponders that are on the cars. There was people blowing my dad's phone up, and even like knowledgeable people like Todd that works for Joe Gibbs texted my dad and was like, you see this right now? So, you know, that's satisfying to see people acknowledge what you're doing and even a lot of the guys from the junior motorsports team and things like that they'll come and talk to us now because they realize you know we're smaller a smaller team doing a lot with what we got i was about to say have you gotten to befriend a lot of those guys that were kind of driving for those cup level teams like junior motorsports and gibbs and stuff or or do they kind of keep to themselves they keep to themselves for the most part um you know Somebody like Noah Gragson, you know, I kind of raced with him a little bit before. He still talks to us some. So, I mean, we try to talk to him, but, you know, we're at the end of the day, we're all there to do one thing, so we try to focus. It's it's a lot different than your local short track where you kind of hang out and talk. It's, it's go, pretty serious. It's not You can't go get a bologna burger <laughs> with each other at a speedway. This, right. is, this, is, this is a lot more – maybe not a lot more serious is the right word, but maybe just a, a different level. Right. I'm about to say. The bologna burgers haven't changed today, Speedway. I'll let you know that. I still remember the night you won the championship and you nosed the car in to do that burnout. And by the time I got to you, I think something had done gone kaboom and your dad was doing a <laughs> symbol to like shut it off because you were selling the car. And I was just like, nah, let it fly. <laughs> yeah, that was an awesome night. You know, A Speedway really taught me a lot, you know, as a young, younger kid, you know, 13, 14, whatever it was. Having to start from the back every week and learn how to pass cars, you know, that really helped evolve my career. You know, I can't really thank Brad enough. You know, as a kid, I remember telling my dad, I'm like, man, that's stupid. Like, why do I have to start in the back every week? Yeah, because you want three and in then, a row, yeah. And then my dad was like, you're fine. It, you're learning. You're fine. Yeah. I'm like, no, it's still stupid. Yeah, I'm not saying. <laughs> but, you know, now that, you know, you're 22 years old and – I look back and it's it really I can tell how much it really helped my career and you know I'm be forever grateful. So, how's 2020 looking for you guys? Kind of a, a similar set number of races or probably there's probably still a lot to be worked on, I'm sure, but what's kind of the outlook plans for for next year? 
Um, yeah, there's still a lot um, in the books that we're working on. You know, we're trying to get some more cars. I'm trying to get some super speedway cars. Um, we're trying to do uh, about 20 races this year between the both of us. Um, unless we can find some sponsorship, we would love to run the whole season. But um, if we don't have any help, you know, that's not really feasible for us. But we're looking to do 20 if nothing else. That's another thing I think probably the casual viewer doesn't understand is that it is not the same kind of car that can run at Richmond as can run at you know Michigan or the or the the bigger tracks or the road courses. It's it's a whole different car, right. but they don't you know they don't see that. They just see a car with four wheels and it's going. I mean, how different is that car? That super speedway car that, or the bigger car that y'all have to acquire to even go run those bigger races and not be three hundred laps down off the green. The super speedway cars are, there's not a piece on that. Maybe the steering wheel and the seat. Those are pretty much the only two pieces and the body. See, that's the only good thing about the series is the carbon body. Really, like, back then you had a super speedway body, you had an intermediate body, and you had a short track body. Now all the bodies are the same. Um, the super speedway bodies, they do have a different lower nose, but it's just something you buy and bolt on. You can't move it around. And then the splitter's different, but you change it every week. It's just, like... 30 bolts that holds it on but um the super speedway by our cars themselves are just way different you couldn't take a speedway car and go run anywhere else it's just they're totally different so it's the short track and the intermediate cars for us they're different but they're not as different as somewhere like gibbs or junior yeah well hopefully with all the technology and the advancements y'all have got, you haven't breathed any more exhaust fumes. Because the last time you breathed exhaust fumes, that was, it was, it was, it was a little funny at time. But then I, it, it kind of got a little scary for us when you fell off the race <laughs> car in Martinsville. So, thank, hopefully, you're not breathing exhaust fumes anymore. <laughs> no, I haven't done that. You know, I did have it happen to me one other time in the K and N car at uh, okay. Bristol, but I didn't get nearly as sick. Um, but yeah, it's funny you bring that up because I was just somewhere Saturday and somebody was just making fun of me over it. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a story. So we were sitting there, I was sitting there with uh, some friends of mine and uh, obviously it's, it's getting dark. And I, I kind of, in the back of my mind as a race official sort of person, I know I'm like, all right, whatever happens, this is going to be the last one. They can't restart again. And everything happens, you know, 27 takes off. You're still back there. It's controversy. You come pulling up. And there were two people in my right to my left. They had had a few too many Pepsis. I mean, they were uh, they were sunburnt and they were drunk. They were a bad combination. And they just kept screaming 44. So when you came around and got on top of the car, it just like filled their fire. And it was like, you dang right he was. Like, and I was just like, oh, man, Dylan Bassett. <laughs> you know, that, that's still one memory that haunts me. Um, you still have that picture? There's that one picture someone got of you with your hands up. Yeah, I still got it. And thankfully, <laughs> the Xfinity Series goes there this year. Yes. For the first yes. time in a long time. I don't even remember the last time that they were even there. Or if they even went there. I'm pretty sure they did. It had to be pre-90s. But, you know, I'm... I'm super I, excited that I really hope you get schedule. to drive that race. Nothing against Ronnie. Like, I hope you get to drive that I race. I hope so. You know, that race, it owes me at least two. Like, yeah, definitely. That one, and then I think it was the very next year, um, Peyton ended up brake checking me on that 10 to go restart and ended up into my day. But that place owes me at least one. Well, you know what? You can get the same grandfather clock that you should have got in your late model races if you can pull it off. I would love that. Well, man, I, I appreciate you taking time, and I just want to let you know that, you know, no matter how, I don't mean this is a bad pun about your size, but no matter how small this thing is, I know a ton of people that still keep up with you and are still glad to see you racing, and no matter how many races you get to run, there's a lot of people that, that even from A Speedway, and I'm sure UARA and stuff, that that want to see you do good. So I hope you, I hope you know that and wish you the best of luck, brother. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate you letting me talk to you.